Um, all right, so I'm going to be giving an uh, overview of a poster that Umenta presented last week at a workshop. Um, it's somewhat provocatively titled, How Can We Be So Slow? Realizing the Performance Benefits of Sparse Networks. And it's co-authored by Kevin Subutai and myself. Um, we presented it at the Sparsity and Neural Networks workshop. Um, as of the time of recording, at least, I guess, today, um, the assets for the workshop are still online, Google, I mean, YouTube Live, posters, you can go and see them if you go to the uh, URL down at the bottom left. All right. So basically, you know, as you guys know, sparse networks and nothing. Yeah, all right, so I should clarify, yeah. So basically what I've done, it's not the first panel, the first panel is the summary. So I've moved the summary to the end. Okay, so, so this is a very short attention span, people. The first panel is like, all right, this is the synopsis, but it's actually the conclusions, all right? But basically, I've split it into slide by slide, panel by panel. I'm going to go for it, panel by panel. Sparse networks should be dead networks, but networks can be dead. Yeah. All right, well, we'll get to that. Okay. All right. It's the buildup. All right. So anyway, you know, sparse networks, nothing new. We've known about them for a while. You know, they differ from the um, sort of dense traditional brethren in two important ways. We can remove interconnections between the neurons and typical, you know, dense network. Um, each neuron is connected to each and every network neuron in the previous layer. Uh, we can remove some of those in sparse um, networks. So each neuron is only connected to a subset of the other neurons in the previous layer. Um, this is termed weight sparsity. Uh, we can also look at limiting the number of neurons that can become simultaneously active in any given layer. Um, you know, this is termed activation sparsity. Um, what's interesting is that you can actually, you know, remove a lot of the neural interconnections, you can aggressively limit the, uh, the number of activations, and you can still train sparse networks that are as accurate as their dense counterparts. Um, it's possible in some cases for some networks to move up, remove up to 95% of the interconnections between the neurons, you know, for activation sparsity, you may be able to limit, um, you may be into, able to introduce 90% sparsity. Um, as you can imagine that basically if you visualize this, you know, as you're removing neuron interconnections, you're placing zeros into the weight matrix, as you're limiting activations, you're placing zeros into the activation matrix, you know, this is simplifying that matrix multiplication, right? This become, is becoming a lot simpler. Most of the subproducts you're now computing have one or more zero terms associated with them. We should be able to optimize that. Um, if you leverage both activation sparsity and weight sparsity simultaneously, it has a multiplicative effect, right? You can get two orders of magnitude performance acceleration, right? Or at least you should be able to, I should say. Um, you know, so if you have 90% activation sparsity, 90% weight sparsity, that's you know, two orders of magnitude reduction in the non-zero subproducts that you need to compute. So basically, given that, why are we even bothering with dense networks? Why are sparse networks not the de facto standard? And the reason is that it's actually incredibly tricky to realize the benefits of sparsity on today's hardware. When you look at the literature out there, when you look or do your own experiments, as we've done here, you see that even though you're reducing the number of non-zeros in the matrices very, very significantly, the performance benefits are very, very muted, right? In the experiment we have on the right-hand side, um, you know, only one out of every 20 values in that weight matrix are non-zero, yet the performance benefits we're seeing, if we're lucky, approach 3x. So of this sort of 20x reduction in, you know, the computational cost, if you will, we're able to realize 3x of that benefit, which is a little depressing. And also, you know, to date, I've certainly not seen anyone who successfully leveraged activation and weight sparsity simultaneously to sort of get those true multiplicative benefits. And so this is something that Numenta has been looking at and researching, and we've come up with novel ways of really harnessing the sparsity in these networks on existing hardware. So FPGAs, CPUs, and GPUs, we can really make these sparse networks performant using some of the techniques we're going to describe in the poster. Unless it's otherwise noted, the experimental setup relates to this convolutional neural network that we trained. It's got four layers, two convolutional layers, two FC linear layers, got about 2.5 million, million parameters. We trained it on the uh, Google speech commands data set, and we created three versions of it. Basically, your base, your dense baseline, and then two sparse versions of sparse dense, where we have weight sparsity, we don't constrain the activations, and we have a sparse sparse version where we simultaneously exploit 
weight sparsity and activation sparsity. We're about 95% weight sparse overall. We get to about 98% activation sparsity, and we use some K winners to take all to determine which neuron, which activations uh, we're going to allow. 98 or 88? 88, sorry, 88, my bad. Um, I think it's also important to note that we're not compromising accuracy here. The accuracy of these sparse networks is equivalent to the original dense network. Has that been true for other people who are doing sparsity? Have they also been able to keep the accuracy? Um, I mean, are you, are you proposing that we've solved this problem mapping as a hybrid? Do you think we can solve the other? I mean, has that also been, did that resolve itself? I think we play in a higher sparsity, you know, a higher level of sparsity than most people approach. That said, there is literature out there talking about, you know, 95% sparsity and things like that, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, not, it's not unheard of to go to that length, right? Most people don't go as far. I mean, if you look, for instance, you know, part of it is just the hardware, right? So GPUs can exploit 50% sparsity. If you go any higher, it doesn't benefit you anything. So, you know, a lot of stuff out there is 50% sparse because that's all the hardware supports. Um, but generally, people are, are assuming they're not going to be accurate. Correct. Right. I mean, you can do a trade off. If you look at, for instance, Neural Magic's website, you can see that they have what's called conservative sparsity and aggressive sparsity. Aggressive sparsity is you push the sparsity even further and you trade off accuracy for increased performance, right? So you're always willing to make that trade off. If you've got a 98% accurate network, which our network here is on the Google speech commands, maybe you're willing to see it be 97 or 96 but you could maybe get another 50% performance or something like that. Those kind of trade-offs you can make, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, why do we have this problem? Why can't we exploit the sparsity? Um, the problem is today, as you look at general purpose hardware, it really likes dense regular structure and predictable data access patterns. It takes a relatively long period of time to move data from main memory to the execution unit, potentially hundreds of cycles. And so you really need to be able to know what data you're going to access way in advance of its actual use to get it there in a timely manner. Um, also, most hardware today leverages wide vector units, SIMD units, and so you want to be able to sort of load in a block of data, you want to process all of those data elements, you want to be performing the same sequence of operations on contiguous data elements so you can leverage the SIMD units. As you can imagine, you know, dense regular matrix multiplies fit this perfectly, and current hardware screens when you do um, dense matrix multiplies. Contrast this with sparse networks where you have some irregular pattern of non-zero singletons scattered throughout the matrix. This is that more unpredictable. You've got to figure out where they are in the matrix. You've got to figure out what other value in the other matrix they correspond to. You've got to load them, you've got to combine them, you've got to persist them if they're singleton values. It really makes it hard to use the vector element, the, the vector engines and things like that. Um, I think that What's pretty depressing in many cases is that it's often more efficient and faster on current hardware just to treat a sparse network as dense and just multiply the zeros as depressing as that seems, right? Rather than trying to special case and find the non zeros. Um, people have obviously recognized this problem and been a variety of different techniques and proposals for how to make sparsity more hardware friendly. One of the most common constraints that people impose is block sparsity. So rather than having sort of randomly located single terms, you constrain it and say non-zero elements must occur in blocks within the matrices. This does two things. Is it obviously for any given level of sparsity reduces the total number of non-zero entities that are present, but it also starts to introduce some locality. You can start to leverage the SIMD units and things like that. You do start to see some performance benefits when you take this approach. Unfortunately, there's two problems is still figuring out where the blocks are located. There's still some additional memory accesses. There's still some uncertainty. And really, as you make the blocks larger and larger, your performance gets better. But the maximum achievable accuracy that you start to see with your neural net starts to degrade, right? So if you have these big honking blocks in your matrix, it's really difficult to train an accurate matrix with that, right? So you've got these two competing constraints. Right, you want to make my block large as possible, I'm back to the Exactly, right. So for a given sparsity level, right? So, you know, basically if I have a single block. If I say, okay, if I have a 10% of my connections, yeah. then if I force you to put them into blocks, it reduces that. It does, yeah. Especially if you just have one, you know, the logical expense of one block. It's odd to me that making the blocks larger reduces that. That would have fucked up. 
it, it does for a, I mean, as, as you as you allow more non-zeros, it does. But if you keep the number of non-zeros constant, right, you're applying di oh, additional so constraints. I have fewer blocks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. That's yeah. Really nice. really what you say. Fewer large blocks. All right. Right. Because I'm thinking like, oh, I have six blocks. I make them larger. Why do they have to do that? No. No, that's, that's a good point. Yeah. So essentially, you keep the num number of non zeros constant and then you force them to be in blocks, right? Then you're going to hit problems. Um, so, really, what we need to be able to do is come up with a sparsity pattern that works with hardware but imposes less constraints than um, block sparsity. And that is exactly what Numenta has done. Oh, Lawrence, just to clarify, you were talking about um, speeding up inference, not training. Is that right? Uh, you know, training's on our to-do list, right? Um, and essentially, once we start to understand sparsity and control sparsity and being able to sort of, you know, do that in inference, the logical extension is to start to do this at training as well, right? Um, you know, a sure. lot of the way that we want to train networks is sort of sparse from the start. We're not looking here at pruning. So a lot of people sort of train a dense network, and so there are no sparse advantages, and then you sparsify it, if that's even a word. Um, but we would train sparse from the start. Um, and so once you do that, then you can actually start to exploit sparsity during the training process, right? It's still a to do on our list, but you know, stay tuned. Okay, thank you. Oh, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Um, okay, uh, just one thing I mentioned for Jeff's sake, this is not what we presented last week. Yeah. This is the, the older stuff yeah. that we've uh, yeah, yeah, released. We haven't, we haven't talked about that. Yeah. That's still in process. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So basically, this is our novel proposal, if you will, which is essentially rather than introducing blocks, um, what we want to be able to achieve is still sort of random ish fine grained sparsity, the only constraint we're introducing is that adjacent filters or adjacent weights shall have none overlapping sparsity patterns. And what that allows us to then do is to take these sparse patterns and basically collapse them into a single dense kernel or a single dense structure that can then be efficiently handled by the hardware. Yeah, I didn't, under, I didn't parse your first sentence there. So basically, this is why I was going to jump to this example here, right? So you can see that. All right. The first sentence was like, what were you? What we're going to allow to happen is, right, that you can basically choose any sparsity pattern you want, yeah. right, with the constraint that some set of adjacent adjacent in whatever dimension you deem appropriate, kernels or weights shall not overlap. The non-zero element shall not overlap. In the, if you think about each weight thing being a matrix, each kernel having a weight matrix, yeah. um, kernel A and kernel B, the non-zero pieces don't overlap. Oh, I see. You're yeah. talking about it's not adjacent weights in a particular matrix. Right. It's, it's the same. Oh, sorry, adjacent set, adjacent weights. Adjacent oh, sorry, adjacent different, neurons. Different All right. Kernels are in different matrices. Yeah. Yeah. So I should probably clarify that. Yeah. Matrices here, they're all the same dimension. And you're going to say, if I'm looking at a particular location in all of those, only one of them has a non-zero. I know. Yeah. That's interesting. Odd thing to think of. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> so anyway, no, that that that's that 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 that's. Well, obvious by that culture, no. it's an interesting idea. He was under a deadline. I remember, and suddenly he had this insight. Okay. That is a uh, a valid a, a valid uh, addition, Jeff. That essentially we're not talking about you know weights in a single kernel or weights in a single neuron. This is across yeah, well, kernels across neurons. Yeah, sorry, I meant adjacent and adjacent. Yeah, adjacent across matrices. Yeah, yeah. The third yeah. Yes. Sorry, my apologies. So yeah, so essentially you can see this here and this. So this is an example for 50% sparsity, sparsity with a five by five convolutional kernel. You can see that you know for sparse kernel A, it's a pretty random pattern. 50% of the uh, the kernel values are non-zero. Similarly for kernel B, the only constraint is that none of the non-zeros overlap. And what that allows us to do is take these two sparse kernels and 
combine or condense or collapse them into a single dense kernel that we can then hand to the hardware. So we don't need any of these funky BSR, CSR formats or so anything you're like that. The hardware is actually computing these. Uh, it's just doing at the same, same time, time and it's just doing a dense operation it knows no better it has density it's got sequential operations it can prefetch it can use simd units and then basically we insert some cleanup code at the end to basically separate out these subtotals out yeah so from a hardware yeah, perspective let's try a clever idea uh, it's interesting you know to think about the mathematics of what you can how much of this you can do based on how many kernels you have and how many you know, the i mean that's what seems a very difficult problem to think about maybe not no. okay yeah <laughs> we, we collapse the kernels two kernels here but uh in the implementation uh, which we don't we do anymore. we do actually uh, okay uh, well I mean, it would be easy if you just said i'm just going to up front Decide what these what these masks are. That's what we've done. Okay, yeah, you can. Not, it's not like you discover a mask in kernel A and discover a mask in kernel B and say let's try to move it around. It's more like you're just saying, hey, if I'm going to ten of these guys, we'll just upfront allocate who which which kernel gets this switch. Right. Okay. Uh, it, it's a generative thing. You, you start with one kernel of whatever sparsity. Like for instance, uh, when we have uh, uh, eight kernels, there's only three samples per kernel. You start with one. <clears throat> and then you randomly pick the other ones with the smaller set of values. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just All right, so as long as you didn't up front, it's an easy problem. You just yeah. Up well, up front, pick these things. Yeah. I was thinking on my commute in this morning that, you know, because I noticed that we do say here that we use a static mask, right? I do think we may be able to get this to work during pruning and things like this. I was thinking about that on the way in yeah. as well. So I don't want to say that we can't leverage it during pruning because well, I believe I, we can. I, 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 this is all with a static This is with a static mask, but we shouldn't. In a real network, how many of these masks am I dealing with at a time? Well, if we had uh, ninety percent sparsity, there'd be ten of them that would. But we actually. Right. I mean, in the real. Oh, I see. So here we go. The final, the final network may have a, maybe it has a hundred of these. Yeah, yeah. But we can take ten at a time. Exactly. Yeah. So we don't have to resolve all of them. No. Right? We just resolve as many as we can, collapse them into one, then resolve as many as we can, collapse them. Yeah, yeah so yeah. basically the set of adjacency you care about is dictated by the degree of sparsity. Right. Uh, so, but I was I was worried like, oh, we have to do this across all the potential masks. No, we can just pick a subset of the masks. Yeah. And, and, um, mm -hmm. and make that work. The non-overlapping really requirement is yeah, only. The non-overlapping requirement is only for the set that we're collapsing. So here yeah, yeah, it's yeah. in two. On this one, I'm cheating slightly because we didn't have space for this in the paper. But Kevin made such a beautiful diagram. I figured we had to use it. This is showing how we have 80% sparsity and we collapse five of them into a single kernel. And so you'd expect a linear speed up with the degree of sparsity. Here we're taking five kernels, yeah. we're collapsing them into one. The hardware knows no different. It's basically performing dense operations, which it loves. There's no overheads, there's no BSR, there's no indirection, there's no lookups. It's just crunching numbers. And then we have some cleanup code at the end. Um, what do we call this? Complementary kernels. Complementary kernels. All right. I have a different, different, depending on what you apply it to, it has different names, but, you know. Okay, well, it's a, it's a nice idea, and therefore you might want to give away a particular first way. Yeah. Well, we haven't trademarked it yet as a problem, right? So when we, oh, when we get our TM, I know, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> Complimentary. People want to talk about it. Yeah. Name for it, so. Numentous sparsity. Well, it is all right. Maybe like this original yeah. method. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So basically, you know, the, the the sort of the thing we've glossed over a little bit here is that you need some way to separate out the subtotals, and basically the flexibility of the hardware architecture, architecture depends dictates how easy this is to do, right? So, so basically, we know how to do it. Right? We know how to do we've it. got these masks. We've got the masks. We know so how to do it. What, it is the, what is the hardware operation to bring us apart? Yeah, yeah. So basically, the all hardware pretty much supports permuter operations, right? That allow you to shuffle. Um, elements within a vector or within some limited subset, not across an entire matrix, but you know, an AVX, you know, across a, an AVX vector, FPGAs are more general, but it allows you to do this. So basically, the patterns that we can choose, the overheads associated with extracting the subtotals are dictated by the power, in essence, of the permute operation supported by the hardware. This is why initially we've looked at doing this on FPGAs, where you basically got sort of a sea of compute and you can, can reconfigure it pretty much however you want. And so you have the most 
powerful permute of any general purpose so platform. Do you do a permutation on each one? If you do multiple permutations, one for each kernel? Like the, out kernel, it yeah, you need a separate cleanup step for each of the original. Well, yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to see how, of, how, would, yeah, the, the, how the, would the permutation instruction work. I well, mean, and I'm not going to try and pick all of the bits and stick them all. Yeah, let's let's gloss over that because okay. it, it leads into some of the other okay. cascading sparsity. Right, so can I ask a question? So I can see how that works with like gradual local activation, but we have something which is uh, global to a layer like Jupyter. How does that activation? This is just this, this is just product. we're not talking about it's how we do it both. We're just talking about how we do waste sparsity in this. Yeah, yeah, but isn't that it is, problem? but this this is what we're gonna talk about in the journal. Oh, yeah. In the journal article in October, right? You know, we we, we like to sort of you know space out our impact well, on the world. Exactly. We know how to do it, we're just not gonna tell you. Uh, before I forget, yeah. I have a suggestion when you write the journal article, put in the title. Whatever you want to call it. So we call it complementary kernels, call it complementary you know, complement kernels, saw blah blah. You know, what yeah. I mean? as opposed to having, you know, yeah, yeah. The, the people know what the name is. Jeff sparsely patterns, we'll no, call it. Not, 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 not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like the how can we be so slow? So, title, well, <laughs> yeah, we can reuse that. Clever, but you know, we have an opportunity here to name it. Yeah. And it's a very it's a singular idea that people get their mind around it. Um and uh and therefore you know yeah. it would be good to know what to call it yeah i mean mr block got out there and named block sparsity after like himself right so we should do that too okay. right yeah hundred kernels so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well the reason why i call it complementary curl is, is an analogy to complementary colors where yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a, that's a subtlety that'll be lost on almost everyone. I think, yeah. but, um, <laughs> I, I think, I think this, this vocabulary, complementary kernel makes perfect sense to me for this. Yeah. 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 Exactly. I, I, I think it's fine. Name. I'm just yeah. suggesting that we put that in somewhere in the. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, it's, you know, basically it's complementary kernels. They don't interfere, you know. Still, you know why are we so slow? Complementary yeah, the only thing is with the kernels is that it is reminiscent of convolutional layers, whereas it in fact applies to linear weights as well, right? So kernel, I, I want to extract kernels out because we're All not right. just talking about convolutions yes. here. We're talking about, I'm, I'm not sure about it. Just think about, complementary sparsity, maybe. You know, we're yeah, yeah. able to refer to our work easily. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and it's nice to have an idea that people latch on to where they say, where did that idea come from? Oh, that came from the method. A thousand sparsities. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's actually more than that. I think you'd be pretty bad if you only had a thousand patterns. Um, all right. So we, we, we showed this one. All right. On to the results. Um, basically, here, what we're looking at is the speed up on an FPGA. Um, this is a Xilinx Salvio U250 that we're using. So this is a data center class card. Basically, what we do is we try and pack as many dense implementations on the card. We look at the throughput for the Google speech commands data set. We then pack as many of the sparse dense versions, look at the performance, the throughput, then sparse sparse, look at the throughput. What we found was that, you know, when we look at an entire chip, the throughput for sparse weights, dense activations is 50 times faster or 50 times greater throughput than the dense version. When we leverage both dimensions of sparsity, we get over two orders of magnitude. It's 112x um, improvement in throughput. And this translates to because we're getting faster throughput per network. Each network, each implementation, if you will, is simpler because it's sparse. Um, and so we can, it's just faster per se. And then because it uses less FPGA resources, we can place more of them on a chip. And so we get, you know, higher chip wise throughput. It's why we have these two numbers here. One is just looking at a single instance performance and the other one is looking at the full chip performance. Um, two other interesting notes on this slide is that typically when you think about increasing performance, maybe you're now overclocking it, you're using more aggressive hardware, your power consumption goes up. Here we're living within the identical power envelope as the dense implementation, we're just performing inference on 100 times more samples per second. And so our relative efficiency goes up by two orders of magnitude as well. The other cool thing is that these dense implementations are pretty large, right? They're pretty resource heavy, and you can't actually deploy them on a lot of the sort of edge FPGAs, like the Zinc class, which are you know, these embedded style, low power, much smaller FPGAs. But because of the simplicity and the elegance 
of our sparse implementations, you can actually deploy them onto these edge devices. And so really allowing you know, AI at the edge to become a reality. So we mentioned that um, we've got our, our first, what? Like the I want something new too. <laughs> Sorry. Order my midnight. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a little background. You know? <laughs> All right. <laughs> what am I saying now? All right. <laughs> So anyway, it, we looked at FPGAs because they're the most flexible, but obviously a lot of work is also done on CPUs and on GPUs. So we want to be able to demonstrate that this technique is applicable to all classes of general purpose hardware out there today. So we're now looking at CPUs and GPUs. We did have time to squeeze in some early results here for CPUs. All we're looking at here is a matrix multiplication. We made it 95% sparse and we compared it with Intel's MKL performance for that dense matrix multiplication, right? I'm sorry, MKL is there Math there kernel library. I think they've- supports dense? Yeah, sparse and dense. It, well, this is dense. So this is the dense baseline I'm talking about first. This is called the math kernel libraries. This is the high performance libraries, which are sort of lovingly crafted by Intel run engineers to run fast on their platforms, right? So really, oh, this is the eight fastest. Times the dense and yeah. Times the yeah. Of so we, we, we got, we looked at our sparse implementation, compared it with their dense implementation. So we're 18 times faster. If you think about a 95% sparse matrix multiplication, we've removed one, you know, basically only one in 20 of the elements are non zero. So you'd hope to see maybe a 20x performance improvement. Of that, we can realize 18x, right? Against, again, not just an artificial baseline, but arguably the fastest dense implementation there is out there today created by Intel. Um, we also then did a second series of experiments where we looked at a variety of different sparsity patterns using traditional sparsity techniques and tried to make Intel sparse code, which they have today, which leverages block sparsity and BSR and CSR and all of these sparsity formats. We tried to make that as fast as possible for a 95% sparse matrix. We outperformed that by about 3x. And we can achieve that without relying on large batch sizes. A lot of the high performance sparse, sparse implementations out there today rely on you pushing for, through sort of 64 samples at a time, right? So they're leveraging. So that, that still doesn't, it's not, I didn't understand what that means. You're saying that the, to get these things on a CPU, they assume that you're, what are they assuming? That it, this, this impacts latency. If you, Having a sample at a time and you want to get inferences as fast as possible, you can't do that with errors. But you yeah, have to batch them up 64. Is this like a, uh, a prefetching type of newsprint? It's a data reuse sort of. I mean, essentially, what they're doing is once you have multiple sets of activations, right? So you're pushing through multiple samples simultaneously, right? So normally, this is not really a matrix matrix multiplication, it's a vector matrix, right? You have yeah. a vector of activations in the matrix. They will do a, a matrix matrix computation mm -hmm. and that allows them to exploit other dimensions because you essentially have a dense activation vector, right? And so there's tricks you can play. Um, you still don't get to 18X, but we get to 18X and we don't even rely on the fact we can get 18X leveraging a single input at a time, right? Um, so next steps, you know, we talked about um, our performance on this Google speech commands data set. We're also partnering with Xilinx around um, ResNets and ML Perth. Uh, Xilinx has actually um, pre-released some numbers around that, which you can find on the internet. And Numenter and Xilinx co-presented last week around some of these results too at an FPGA conference in Europe. What we're trying to do now is demonstrate that you know, it's basically possible to create a library that allows you to bring your own sparse network and rapidly deploy it to an FPGA and get the kind of speed ups that we're talking so about. So I understand this, you're saying this should also benefit on GPUs, but we need, we're not showing any results yet. Not yet, GPUs are next, right? But it could, like, It will. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll go stronger and say it will. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I guess this is being recorded, so I shouldn't make categorical statements, but we are fairly confident that this will translate. I'll, I'll back, back up the certainty a little bit as a good scientist. Um, <laughs> this is just an internal research. No, no, no one else is really. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
No, I mean, I, th I think we have a good certainty. So as I said, it all comes down to the, you need some permute support to basically split out these oh, results, yeah. right? Do, 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 they do uh, have, they do have it, right? Okay. We've done some initial analysis. We haven't run the benchmarks. Uh, we're going to start doing that. I have, have to qualify a little bit because uh, uh, some of them have like full crossbars where you can get any permit you want out. Some of them are more restrictive. Uh, so we have to do, we have to dive down and find out which ones all right, and then, well, on the CPU side, we demonstrated the matrix multiplication. What we're working on now is like, can we showcase this in a transformer of done description? Can we take, I don't know, Google BERT and make it 10 times faster uh -huh. using these sparsity techniques? That'll be cool. That's what we're focused on. You know, stay tuned for those results. And then also, I think there was a question from the, um, on the interwebs or the, the zoom at least about whether we can accelerate uh, <laughs> but whether we can do sparse network training and so that's again something we're starting to look at and then i think this is the one the uh the panel i missed over that jeff mentioned right so you know it's sort of weird right we have sparse networks they're high accuracy they're great they're robust they're awesome they should be two orders of magnitude faster than what we can achieve today with dense networks. But you know, the vast majority out there, people out there still don't know what sparsity is. They don't leverage it. People are getting excited because we've got a 2x or a 3x performance improvement, right? Yet there is the potential for 100x, 200x performance improvement leveraging sparsity. And so hopefully what this poster is starting to talk about is that using existing hardware, we don't need to wait for new hardware, right? Using existing FPGAs, GPUs, and CPUs, we can get extremely large speed ups using sparse networks, right? Um, on the FPGA, we've already demonstrated 100x. Um, on CPUs, we've demonstrated 18x, basically speed up line linearly increasing with the degree of sparsity. Um, and so we're working to basically showcase this with more data points. Yeah, 100x is going to stand up to all different types of networks? No, because I think the problem is, we'll have to see. So basically, the 100x is if you can leverage activation and weight sparsity simultaneously, right? That's trickier on, on well, CPUs so and like GPUs. 20x uh, you know, maybe, right? Because then it's 95% sparse. We know how to do 95% sparse networks, yeah, right? Yeah, it depends if you can do 95% sparse, right? We're yeah. able to do like 80 on some problems. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, I mean, that's the thing. If we can get up to 80, 85, 90 even, we should be able to get 10x. If we can get 9x of that, that'd be pretty cool. That's a lot more than people are seeing in hardware today with like 2x and things like that. Like, you know, with NVIDIA's 50% sparsity, you get 2x. If we can show 9x, you know. Not even 2x. Yeah, that's Maybe pretty cool. 1.3, 1.4. So we can, yeah, yeah so we'll see. Just, just again, on the marketing side of things, these two headlines are very kind of, uh, they're, they're not as strong as they could be. And when you first read them, it's like, oh, what are you talking about here? I mean, you know, should be, can be, it sounds like the same type of thing. You know, if, if one you, if you could just say, hey, sparse networks should be 100 times faster. Yeah. You know, sparse networks can be 100 times faster. So that would like, oh, that might get me to understand, you know, the, you know this. Yeah, that's true. You know, it's, it should be a fast network. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, that's weaker. You know what I'm saying? But, but if we can't say that 100 times, if that's not true, then it gets a little bit. But you could, I, I would still even just, Internally, I would say I would have phrased the Spark network should be faster, or should be much faster. Spark yeah. networks can be much faster. Yeah, um, but I have too verbose. Yeah, it's a little bit, yeah. It's, too, it's a little wordy. It's That's a good point. Yeah. I think also that, yeah, I mean, we could have made it stronger. I'm British, so one tends to be modest. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know me, I'm a sort of, uh, you know, <laughs> modesty embodied um, is me. Um, but, you know, so we'll, we'll, make, we'll make the journal article. More breast. Well, right. We don't think 100x is reasonable for everything. You just, you can't say that, but, uh, there will always be counter examples, right? I mean, I think we may not be able to push to 100x on transformers and things like this, right? Um, you know, I think if we can get an order of magnitude on transformers, that's pretty cool. Um, we do need to understand how we can leverage. You know, the thing that really excites me, right, is that you don't want to necessarily try to be squeezing every last ounce of sparsity out of the weight dimension, right, to increase your performance, right? You do start to hit some accuracy constraints, right? There's ways that, you know, Supertize talked about in the past is like trying to stabilize it by going wider and things like that. So there's a lot of other approaches we can leverage. But if you can leverage activation sparsity too, you just get that multiplicative kicker, right? So if we're 10, if we're 90% sparse, 
in you know weights that's 10x you know if we even go 2x even if we can just achieve 2x sparsity or 50 percent sparsity we've doubled that uh, in the activations well, we've doubled this, that right this poster is illustrating a technique for weight right not... we haven't disclosed how to do like, we know how to do it yeah I, and we just don't talk about it. this poster is not due to space constraints yeah okay. obviously we would be transparent I mean, I mean, I just yeah, yeah. Okay. about how to do uh, uh you know yeah yeah um so I think hopefully in the journal article, right, we've got unlimited pages there. So we're, we're, we'll spell it out in uh, nauseating both detail. Yeah, both of them, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Lawrence. Maybe no. we can, uh, oh, that was going to oh, say oh, oh, one more okay. further reading. So you know we've actually published on this, and there's blogs and white papers. So um, go check it out, and then bug us with questions. All right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Well, one detail I didn't quite get in the first image you showed, uh, there was always one square shaded. Does that have any um, significance? Yes, yeah, so that's the non-zero element. No, oh, no, no, oh, sorry. No, oh, no, one. No, oh, yeah, yeah. That's just because. Why don't you bring it up? Yeah, no, no, that one can't be filled with basically. Still forward. Yeah. Well, it, it's just because it's well, a five. I can't it. It's a five by five, right? And so. So oh, it whatever. always has to be the same amount. Um, uh, so it doesn't just have to be a complement. It always has to be evenly uh, split. It, it doesn't need to be, right? Yeah, I'm trying. Uh, sorry. I'm you, trying. Know, you, can, you can be more flexible, maybe the last. Oh, and for, it doesn't really for linear weights as well, right? You basically don't have to do it when you're doing uh, linear layers. You can have yeah, all of them so filled. So you have one curl that has more samples than Oh, sorry, this one. Yeah, so this one, sorry, this this guy here. Sorry, Vivian. So what is that, what is that grade approximate? If, if you basically take 25 divided by 2, you've got a remainder, right? Yes. Yeah, it's the remainder. Well, I mean, the thing is, we can fill it, right, is the answer, right? So, I mean, you could. The thing is, is that if you do that, then uh, the kernels have unequal uh, samples. So then their, uh, their summations are off by a little bit. Then you have to kind of adjust that a little bit. So it's, it's nicer if you could, like in this no, case, where we divide by five, it was a clean one. You don't have that one thing. Now, you can take that zero and float it around between different kernels, so it doesn't necessarily have to be in that one location. So you can introduce that element of randomness to the thing if you want to still keep it, you know, every computation being a sub yeah. Yeah. But also, it's it's a kernel-specific thing, right? I mean, it's called convolutional kernel. It doesn't, because of the, you know, the way linear layers map, yeah. it doesn't, doesn't apply. Well, I mean, you still are mapping things to- your, To something, right, uh, yeah, to, yeah. To, to your to your SIMD unit. So yeah. you're going to have a remainder too. It's just might be just weird at the end. Yeah, I mean, it's, SIMD units are better because I mean, they're not odd numbers, a, right? A lot so. of details here, but the basic answer, I think, to Vivian's question is- It's, that, it's a remainder. It's a remainder when you do a division. Yeah. And I don't know if that answers Vivian's preferred point. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I was just not sure if it's like, necessary that you always have to divide it evenly or if uh, no. like one kernel a could have more active ones than kernel b for example it, it makes the hardware simpler um but in an absolute sense it doesn't have to be that way but like i was i was telling uh, uh subitai if you do that and you basically have unequal number of samples then uh their their summations are going to be at a different bias of uh, uh, scale to the other ones so then you have to compensate for that so You'll, you'll pay for it someplace. You can also say this neuroscience inspired, right? Don't you have a blind spot at the back of your eye? <laughs> 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 <laughs>